Stalin's victories against the Wehrmacht are hailed across the globe, but the economy that drives this success, the tanks and guns that destroy the Germans and that fuel the powers them rest on a brutal system of forced labor, the Gulag. This is a World War II in real time special. I'm Spartacus Olson. Now, the word gulag is actually an abbreviation for Glavnoye Upravlenie Lagre, or Chief Administration of the Camps. It's the agency that runs the camps and is administered by the NKVD. The term isn't often used in the Soviet Union as a name for the network of camps and labor colonies. Instead, people talk of the Lagerie or Zona, meaning camp or zone. The men and women imprisoned in the camps are both political prisoners and common criminals. The line is often blurred between the two. Now, the origin of the camps is in August 1918, when Vladimir Lenin decided that participants in an anti-Bolshevik uprising in the city of Penza should be locked up in a concentration camp. By the end of 1920, there were 107 camps holding people considered class enemies like kulaks, priests, merchants, and members of the white opposition. Prisoners in Lenin's camps did carry out hard labor, but the camps maintained at least a facade of a re-educative purpose. But beginning in 1929, this was dispensed with, and labor became far and away the priority. To fuel Stalin's five-year plan, the camp network was expanded to exploit the raw materials of sparely populated Kazakhstan, Siberia, and the far north. During Stalin's Great Terror, the NKVD ensured a steady stream of people into the camps. Wreckers and saboteurs, kulaks, and national minorities like Poles and Ukrainians. Forced laborers built some of the great projects of the 1930s. The Kolmia Highway in the Far East, the White Sea Baltic Canal, sections of the Baikal Amur Railway, even parts of the Moscow Metro. By the outbreak of war, the camp system has grown to a colossal size, from 179,000 prisoners in 1930 to 1.7 million in 1939. In the factories, mines, and lumber mills attached to the camps, prisoners churn out a huge portion of some of the Soviet Union's key materials. They provide 76% of the nation's tin, 60% of its gold, 46.5% of its nickel, and 25.3% of its timber. When Germany invades in July 1941, the camps go on a war footing. Refusal to work becomes an act of treason for which five to ten years can be added on to sentences. As strategic industries are moved eastwards, it is labor camp prisoners who build much of the new infrastructure. Aircraft factories and oil refineries in Kuibyshev, metallurgical complexes in Sverdlovsk Oblast and Transcaucasia. Prisoners from the Norilag camp build much of the entire mining city of Norilsk, constructing roads, railways, and oil pipelines. Labor camps churn out ammunition, uniforms, weapons, and other military supplies such as field telephones and ammunition crates. Some 225,000 of the more educated and skilled prisoners are moved to special colonies to produce tanks and airplanes. Hundreds of thousands have already died in the years since the camps opened. Now, as labor intensifies, mortality rates will only increase. The bulk of the prisoner's diet is made up of bread and balanda, a watery soup of cabbage and potatoes, sometimes with some pork fat or fish. Rations are cut on the second day of the war. As the food supplies dwindle, the protein disappears. In some cases, pork and fish are replaced with dog meat. An inspection in 1942 in Vyatlag reports that the food is nearly inedible and lacking in vitamins. When deliveries are interrupted, prisoners sometimes go days without food. Lev Razgon works at a forestry camp in the far north. Later on, he will recall how the weaker prisoners in the camp simply waste away during the first brutal months of the war. Within two or three months, the camps were filled with living skeletons. Indifferent, devoid of the will and desire to live, these skeletons, bones held together by dry, gray skin, sat on their bunks and indifferently awaited death. Carts and later sleds would come in the mornings to haul away the practically weightless corpses to the cemetery. In a state of 
permanent hunger, the prisoners develop rituals around their food. They agonize and debate over whether to eat their morning bread in one go or save some for later. One prisoner, Dmitri Panin, will recall. Every bite of bread should be chewed thoroughly to enable the stomach to digest it as easily as possible. If you always split your ration and put aside a part of it for the evening, you are finished. Eat it all at one sitting. If, on the other hand, you gobble it down too quickly, as famished people often do in normal circumstances, you will also shorten your days. In these conditions, mortality rates soar. An inspector who visits Volgostroy in 1942 reports simply that people are dying of starvation. Diseases associated with malnourishment like scurvy and pellagra are common. That's not to mention the typhus and respiratory diseases that spread in the cramped, dirty, freezing barracks. In the second half of the 1930s, mortality rates fluctuated between 2 and 6 percent. Now, according to the official NKVD statistics, these rates are 25 percent in 1942 and 22 percent in 1943. Next year, 1944, they will drop to 9 percent, still significantly above pre-war numbers. These rates are likely underestimated. For instance, they don't include prisoners who died on the journey to the camps. The camp administration also has a habit of releasing prisoners on the edge of death so that they are not counted in the death statistics. These conditions mean that the camps share the fundamental flaw of all forced labor systems. Slave laborers are nowhere as efficient as paid workers. That's something the NKVD quickly becomes aware of, as records of their internal meetings show. By December 1941, the leadership are complaining about prisoners refusing to work in the awful conditions and that millions of rubles are being wasted on the keep of these slackers. It's not only money that is being wasted. Malnourishment and disease are destroying human capital, too. The NKVD notes that the increase in disability now taking place is ominous. In some camps, it is becoming downright dangerous. After the war, the NKVD will write glowing reviews of the contribution that the labor camps make to the Soviet economy. And yes, the system is churning out an enormous amount of equipment for the war, just as Albert Speer's slave system does. That's not to mention extracting vast quantities of raw materials. But when you compare it to the titanic economy of the United States, it's hard to not think that this is an inefficient way of doing things. The army of workers churning out endless tanks in Detroit or bombers in Michigan are certainly not dying of hunger and disease. The Nazi and Soviet obsession with forced labor is self-punishing. But nothing will change. Instead, the prisoners are simply pushed harder as living conditions continue to plummet. Officially, the working day is set at 11 hours, but shifts of 12 to 16 hours are not unusual. One prisoner will later describe his 13-hour workday in a textile factory. At 6, we had to be in the factory. At 10, we had a five-minute break to smoke a cigarette, for which purpose we had to run to a cellar about 200 yards away, the only place on the factory premises where this was permitted. Infringement of this regulation was punishable with two years extra imprisonment. At 1 o'clock came a half-hour break for lunch. Small earthenware bowl in hand, one had to dash frantically to the canteen, stand in a long queue, receive some disgusting soya beans which disagreed with most people, and at all costs be back at the factory when the engine started working. After that, without leaving our places, we sat till 7 in the evening. In March 1942, the Moscow Gulag administration reminds all camp commanders that prisoners must be allowed at least 8 hours of sleep. Unsurprisingly, this rule is often ignored. Anything as low as four or five hours is common. Now, despite their miserable conditions, prisoners are caught up in the patriotic wave that sweeps the country. The writer Evgenia Ginsburg, currently serving an 18-year sentence in Kolmia, will later recall, we were ready to forgive and forget now that the whole nation was suffering, ready to write off the injustice done to us. For some of them, this patriotism provides a route out of imprisonment. During the first three years of war, 975,000 prisoners are given amnesties and released into the Red Army. This can be a case of out of the frying pan into the fire, though. One man named Avram Shifrin is sent to a penal battalion. He claims that out of 500 men, just 100 were given rifles. The officers apparently tell them, your weapons are in the hands of the Nazis. Go and get them. 
Others are better treated. Many prisoners see this as a chance to make amends to the Soviet states. Letters written from soldiers to their former camp commanders often speak of their gratefulness for a chance to pay back a debt to society, to defend the motherland, and for the trust placed in them. Of course, one must take these letters with a pinch of salt. These men are writing to their former captors. But there is tangible evidence that they at least have a grain of truth. In a sample of 1,000 prisoners by the end of the war, 85 will have become officers, 34 party members, and 261 will have won medals. Five ex-prisoners will become heroes of the Soviet Union. The the pressing irony is that Red Army prisoners of war will soon be making the journey in the opposite direction. Liberated from German concentration camps as the Soviets advance westward, these men will be branded traitors. Tens of thousands of them will be thrown into the labor camps. The whole system might just look like an absurdly inefficient way to uphold the Soviet economy and political system. But that misses an important point. Stalin may have placed economic production as the system's number one priority back in 1929, but in reality, this is always secondary to the Soviet doctrinal and Stalin's personal desire to control USSR's population and eliminate those considered enemies, traitors, and counter-revolutionaries. This campaign will only accelerate as the Red Army advances westwards. The Big Four have just declared in Moscow that Nazi war criminals should be punished. But right now, Stalin is overseeing the deportation of 70,000 Turkish-speaking Karachais from Caucasus on charges of collaboration. Like the Poles, Baltic Germans, and the Finns, they will be dumped in Kazakhstan, where they will work and die. Over the next decade, the number of people confined to hardship and misery in the labor camps will only grow higher. No matter who wins, millions of people are set to lose everything in this war against humanity. To understand how all of this is possible to maintain, you have to understand the depth and width that NKVD carries in the Soviet system of the time. You can learn more about that in my NKVD special episode here. Subscribe and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv to become a part of our much more fun system to create content like this, exposing our past so that we can all work together on a better future. Never forget.